Hey folks, this is Dr. Emily Sherning with American Resiliency here with an up-to-date 2050 climate forecast for all of our friends in Indiana. Last time we looked at Indiana, it was a sleeper hit. This appeared to surprise no one more than the folks commenting from the state who wanted to make sure everyone is aware that their muggy climate is unpleasant and that their rivers are full of snakes. I gotta say though, anyone who looks at infrastructure investment, they might suspect Indiana does actually know what's going on. Indiana is currently ranked number one in infrastructure in the US. They're engaged in large bipartisan infrastructure projects through 2026, working on a total upgrade. Roads, water, internet, everything. And check it out, this is in figure 31.1 of the National Climate Assessment. You might notice Indiana claims here that none of these activities are climate related. Not any of them. I grew up in Chicago, Indiana. I'm on to you. And I know that your rivers have a totally normal amount of snakes. So let's get back to business and see what the revised projections say. Just so you know where to find my source material, this forecast is based on the National Climate Assessment, which was just updated. It comes out every four or five years. We received the fifth National Climate Assessment in November of 23. And there were some big changes in the projections in this new edition. So we're updating our outlooks for every state. We use the fifth national climate assessment because it represents the highest consensus climate science available. Your tax dollars paid for the development of review of this document, but the federal government doesn't allocate any money towards communicating this document. That's why I started this nonprofit. American Resiliency is focused on communicating this information to the public. We run on your donations. If you wanna follow along with me, here's what to do. From the main website, click on the chapters tab and you can go to all figures. It's important to read stuff in context too, but while I'm talking about figures that might show what kind of heat is expected to impact your home, all of these figures are arranged numerically here. I'll tell you the number and you can come over here and find the figure quickly. Many of these images are really high resolution. You can download it. You can get the information you need for your house. Okay, so you know the conditions I'm modeling for 2050. We're talking about regularly hitting 2C as a global temp increase. That seems like our most likely climate future. Even if we can stay on the target for emissions reduction, 2 is the best we're likely to get. We've blown through our margin for business as usual. We're going to be dealing with change. And looking at changes at 2C in like a national overview, let's check out figure 1.14. You can see in this figure that Indiana is in this moderate change band that covers a lot of the country. If you've been following along with this series, you might have seen that Iowa and Ohio's forecast videos have already been released. Those states are nearby, they're also in the band, and they really show that there's a big range of change present in there. Iowa's lower change, Ohio's quite high. Let's dig into it and see where Indiana falls. So here we are, we're looking at figure 2.11. That's changes in hot and cold extremes, which is a good way to unlock our understanding of how seasonality will change from state to state. In Indiana, you're gonna love this. Check this out. Just big picture on the hot days. You look so much better than Illinois. It's like right along the border, right? Let's zoom in on this. So most of Indiana is facing an additional about 10 days over 95 a year, closer to five additional days up north, down at the very southern end of the state, more like two and a half weeks. It's not delightful to hear that the sweaty season is increasing, but look at this regionally, it's not terrible. This is not a bad increase. We don't see a signal of a significant urban heat island forming around Indianapolis, which is kind of surprising. It looks like a little more than 10 additional days over 95 for Indianapolis, less than that by Fort Wayne. So these are good outlooks for your more populated areas. Let's go and look over to the warm nights portion of this figure. So we're still in figure 2.11 here. We're just zoomed over to the right-hand side of it. The colors on Indiana here indicate 10 to 15, 15 to 20, and 20 to 25 additional nights over 70. Warm nights, nights where it won't get cool enough for the body to repair itself from heat stress during the day, nights where corn won't be able to fill grain well. For most of the state, you're looking at less than 20 additional warm nights by 2050, except down at the very southern end of the state there, where you might see more like an additional full month of nights over 70. Don't see this pattern very often where the warm nights are increasing substantially more than the warm days. It's worth noting this is similar to the warming pattern we saw from about 1995 to 2015 in the American South. From the perspective of your typical person, this is a pattern of warming you don't notice too much because you already had the air on and at night you were asleep. The impact though is bigger on agriculture. 
Towards the southern end of the state, this would cause decreasing yields of corn and soy. But unless you're in the red on that map we were looking at, I would not exactly call this a red alert. Indiana is by and large cruising under the danger line for significant change in heat stress. Let's go back to the map and look at the winters. We're looking at the change in days under 32 for Indiana. You're projected to lose a lot of cold by 2050. You're losing about three weeks below freezing for much of the state. Down south, the change is actually less. You'll get about two weeks less of winter instead of three weeks less. It's still going to get fairly cold, though. Let's look over to figure 11.3. Over in 11.3, you can see that this figure is very gigantic. Let's explain what it means a little bit. So when we're talking about the plant hardiness zones, that lets us know the average annual lowest minimum temperature. So if you're in this zone here in 7A, it's probably not getting significantly below zero degrees in your winter. We know that Indiana is expecting a uh, shorter winter, a reduction in winter duration, let's see what's happening with the mildness of the winter. So let's see here. Right now, you're in contemporary information at the top, mid-century in the middle. Zooming in, we can see that Indiana is mostly blue with a little dark blue dot, a little bit of that light yellow at the bottom. Here we see that the dark blue dot turned into a light blue dot. That yellow at the bottom is now in the northern part of the state, and we get down to sort of a peach color at the tip. Let's look back at the key. So that indicates that if you were in a 6A, which most of the state was in a 6A, you're gonna be going to a 7A, straight zone shift throughout the state. That means that no matter where you are in Indiana, by 2050, you would expect about a 10 degree increase in your typical winter lows. So a shorter, milder winter, one that is gonna be kind of like the winters in Kentucky today where you're going to have a milder winter, but there's probably at least one decent cold spell. They still tend to get a snow every year in Kentucky. That's what you're going to be thinking about in Indiana as you move towards 2050. And overall, if you look at the landscape in southern Indiana today, that's the quality of landscape that's going to be moving up northwards through the state. It's kind of good that you have an in-state analog for how change is going to progress through the state. It lets you know that a lot of your character is more likely to be able to remain intact. It's fun to note that little island of cold, kind of up by Lafayette, is staying cold. This is a change in the projection, though. This 11.3 is different from what we looked at with plant hardiness zones in Indiana's previous outlook, where that east-west band by Terre Haute, that had looked like it was going to stay about the same. In this update, the NCA5 update, we do see change aligned with the rest of the state. However, let's look back at 2.11. I want to check on Terre Haute because there's some interesting stuff going on there. You can see right in that east-west band, there's a lot of very local variability about how much winter loss you do expect, where there is an island of stability, an island of deviation towards the normal with less winter loss than we would otherwise expect around Terre Haute. And let's keep watching this bubble. We're going to keep an eye on that as we look at our precipitation outlook. Now we're going to go to figure 2.10. We can see that in this figure, Indiana is in the club to have a statistically significant 5 to 10% increase in precipitation by 2050. We see that is consistent if we overshoot 2 degrees and get to 3 degrees. So that's some good news in terms of infrastructure investment. We do expect flooding to be a continued challenge in the Midwest. If we know how much more rain to expect and there's some consistency, it's easier to make a plan. We can do infrastructure work that is generationally protective against flooding. And I like to look at more than one model for these mid-century precipitation increases. Let's also check out figure 4.3. Here in 4.3, we do see consistent projection for a couple more inches of rain throughout the state. Again, with a bubble of deviation towards the normal, towards conditions like today, right around Terre Haute. Speaking of floods, speaking of heavy rain, let's look at figure 2.12, protected changes to precipitation extremes at 2C of global warming. Here, I try to look and see, is there a consistent signal across these three models? Annual maximum daily precipitation, five-year maximum daily precipitation, and total precipitation on heaviest 1% of days. It feels like if we see agreement across the models, we've really got some evidence that there's probably a strong signal for heavy storms, storms carrying just a deluge amount of water headed your way. 
zooming in here at the five-year maximum daily precipitation. So your five-year max, that's going to be your really memorable storms, right? This is a good one for showcasing the trend where we see that this uh, heavy rain shadow does appear to be falling over Indianapolis. So it's a good thing Indianapolis is doing that big infrastructure upgrade. And I'd like to point out again, this bubble of normalcy around Terre Haute that's actually splitting this higher change pattern. We see that in several maps on this figure, 2.12. I do find that very interesting. I know I'm a little focused on this anomaly pattern. It's because it's very similar to the anomaly pattern around my house in Iowa. It's the most similar pattern of deviation towards the norm, deviation towards stability that I've seen anywhere else in the US. And I've spent two and a half years picking through these maps. So it's, so I feel like it's worth pointing out. Overall, you're talking about coming heavy storms to Indiana, trying to get back focused on the overall outlook for the state. You're looking at maybe 10 to 15% more water in these big storms. So it's a good thing you're number one in infrastructure. And with all your totally not climate related investments that somehow anticipate dealing with about that much more precipitation. It's really very surprising, right? All right. So we look at this rain stuff because we all know rain can cause flooding in the Midwest. Let's see what we know about flooding in Indiana. This is a close-up on figure 110, which shows us the projected increase in flood damages. So the darker the color, your greater projected increase in flood damages. You can see that this is much milder in Indiana than in your neighbor, Ohio. Let's look at the river maps and compare that to the darker counties and see if it's riverine flooding or deluge type flooding that's more directly involved in this flood risk. All right, poking over to geology.com, we can see that most of the flood risk is lining up with the Kankakee River. We know the Kankakee River is a rowdy river. Anyone who's from the area, looks like we expect more flooding around the Ohio and a little bit more around the Wabash to a lesser extent than the Ohio. I am not shocked that it's the Kankakee River that wants to flood everyone. Everyone in the region knows the Kankakee is very rowdy. So if you're living anywhere near that, Resilience against flooding, you're going to want to amp up way beyond what you think of as the normal today. Get out of a low-lying area. You know, if you're in the Midwest, if you want to build resilience, the best thing you can do is build resilience on high ground. Don't be in an area that has ever flooded before, is the classic Midwestern homebuyer's advice. You want to make sure that you avoid known threats. This is a good eye on existing flooding threats that look like they are projected to get worse. We know where we're likely to flood. It seems to be where Indiana tends to flood today. It's just amplifying an existing risk. Let's find out where are you going to be on fire. So this is figure 7.4, the fire map. It's kind of a scary figure, but you might like this because many nearby states are looking at changing models for wildfire. And you will notice that you are not even making this map. They are not even modeling increased risk for you because it is so relatively low compared to your neighbors. Really good news for Indiana. This doesn't mean that Indiana is totally like safe. You need to be aware of wildfire danger. I wouldn't highlight this as a direct threat. I feel like it is worth showing you the degree to which you're in a sweet spot where you avoid the direct impacts of a growing regional threat. And it's not like Indiana doesn't have any trees. You have a lot of trees. In the previous outlook, it looked like Indiana's portion of the central hardwoods band was unusually sheltered. It does look like those odds continue to be in your favor. That is really nice. So let me show you some other good stuff about Indiana. For some folks, air quality is a big concern, a big health concern, right? And all of us in the region, we learned in 2023 that we need to worry about wildfire smoke, even if the fires are far away. And that will be a continuing threat. You can see that you're going to want to get air filtration in your home potentially to build resilience, right? But let's look at 14.6. Pollen is another air quality issue. We can see in 14.6 that we do expect pollen counts to drop in almost all of Indiana by 2050, except that particularly high change area right down at the tip. Another positive, many people are grossed out by ticks because ticks are gross. As it gets warmer, it seems like much of the country is being covered by a wave of ticks, which is disgusting. In Iowa, tick levels have by and large seemed pretty normal. I wanted you to check this out. You can see here that Indiana is also the regional leader in the Midwest of having decent tick control so far. You're not seeing the sort of big jumps in Lyme disease in your state that we see in some other Midwestern states. I assume this means you guys also have a good possum population. I have friends who are creeped out by possums, but they're really nice. There are friendly native marsupials 
They want to keep you from getting Lyme's disease. They want to eat every tick they can find. If you're concerned about ticks, you should do what I do and make a habitat for possums because ticks are going to continue to be an escalating threat in our region. Possums are nice. My local possums have made very good neighbors so far. One last challenge point. If you're a person who's concerned about water availability, let's look over to figure 24.12. You can see here where Indiana has groundwater coverage and where it doesn't. It's pretty decent coverage over the whole state. And groundwater, you know, it's intensely local. It's important when you're considering a property to learn about the local groundwater situation. This will give you an idea of where you could expect it to be richer or poorer. And it's not enough to know if groundwater is available. You have to know if it's clean. And Indiana does have some problems with water quality. According to the Environmental Integrity Project, you're actually the worst in the nation as of 2022. I know the state is working on it. Getting that water quality under control is probably your biggest challenge as you get ready for a future that honestly looks to place Indiana not as America's crossroads, but as a seriously desirable destination. The warm-up you're dealing with, the increased precipitation, they're challenges, but they're manageable challenges and you're already doing the work to get ready. A lot of the factors in this outlook, they're lining up for you really nice. Out of the Midwest region, I think it's really worth looking at both you, Indiana, and Iowa as sleeper hits. Relatively good climate stability, lower flooding risks than your neighbors, not as covered in bugs. If you just want to eat some tater tots in peace in a place that still looks and feels like home 20 years from now, these are the places to go. If you're building resilience in Indiana, keep an eye on flooding. Be personally prepared for up to a couple weeks of potentially dangerous heat every summer and advocate for water quality improvements. Your state is in a great position to build generational strength. There is hope and we can prepare for what's coming. Let's get ready. Folks, thanks for listening in. And I'd also like to thank all of the donors and volunteers who contribute to American Resiliency. If you are interested in giving, please check out the donation link on our About page on the YouTube channel or go to our website, www.americanresiliency.org. We are a registered 501c3 if you send us direct donations, they are tax deductible. Thanks to the generosity of this community and both funding and time, we've really been able to step up the quality of our videos for these updated forecasts. Thank you so much. And thanks so much for being here with me. Let's get ready together.